Um, <clears throat> it might get a little nerdy today, so <laughs> bear with me. One of the biggest problems I think that Christianity has today in the West, and especially in this country, is the erosion of trust. As I talk to unchurched people, which in truth doesn't happen a lot, but there seems to be one consistency. People expect Christians to try to get them. People do not expect anything good or decent from Christians. Some people think I'm a sort of a dog catcher who wants to put a leash on them and control their lives. People expect that I want them to stop thinking because no one who thinks would believe one word the church has to say. Lutheranism is based entirely on people engaging the spherical extension above their necks and think for themselves. The head is not just meant to put a head on top, but it is meant to critically engage the teachings of the church. If that were not the case, there would have been no need for a reformation. Shut up and do what the pastor or priest says uh, was the state of the church when Luther and the reformers felt the need to rebel. If we wanted to be authoritarians, we could have left it as it was. If we wanted social control, we had it. Why mess with something we already have? The church in Luther's time was the only way for talented people without a pedigree to make what we would call a career. If you wanted to have power, you had to be born a noble. The one exception was the church. If you had talent, combined with the necessary ruthlessness and devotion, you get, get, could get somewhere and get power. Martin Luther had, could, could have made a fine career in the Roman Catholic Church if he wanted that. He didn't need the Reformation to get anywhere. The road was wide open to him. He needed the Reformation to free his mind which in turn freed the people's mind from the tight control the church exercised on the people. It's not that enlightenment liberated humans from the church, but the reformation liberated the human mind, and in consequence, that made the enlightenment and modern times possible. But when I say that, people stare at me and do not bring together uh, what I say with a loud part of Christians that offers a view of Jesus that is based on social control and often lacks even the most rudimentary forms of ethics and grace. There is a great enthusiasm for holy violence. God will torture people for all eternity if they dare to get religion wrong. And yes, in our text, Jesus talks about judgment. In our theology, God's judgment is a lawyer-free event. No sophisticated argument will get people off the hook when they try to argue their way out of their obligation to act with basic human decency. And there is absolutely no argument to justify spreading lies and hate based on some version of the Bible clearly states. The Bible clearly states nothing clearly so that you don't have to think about it. Some verses happen to make sense today, but often that's accidental, like calling someone a fool. Jesus says in our text today, if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Looks like we're going to hell if you come call someone an idiot or a moron, an imbecile, or a low, low IQ person. Well, it's extreme, but it makes sense, doesn't it? The lexicon says, a fool is silly or stupid. So when Jesus talks about calling someone a fool, it's like we calling someone a moron. That's what the Bible clearly states, isn't it? The escalation trajectory seems a bit off in Jesus' statement. Murder, anger, insult, calling someone a fool. The Bible clearly states about fools, but fools in the Bible are not simply silly or stupid people. In Ecclesiastes 5.1, we read the following. 
Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near, to listen is better than the sacrifice offered by fools, for they do not know how to keep from doing evil. A fool in the Bible is the opposite of a wise person. A wise person keeps the law of God and foolish persons break it and continue to break it while going through the motions of being law-abiding. It is someone who keeps up appearances and thinks God doesn't see it because the smoke of burnt offerings blinds God's eyes. A fool is a liar and a lawbreaker of the worst kind. A fool is a hypocrite. And even though we use the fool in our context, the Bible doesn't mean what we think it means when we leave it as the Bible clearly states. Our gospel text today says you are liable to the council. It's a translation of a concrete legal term. The Greek says sanedrio, which means Sanhedrin. And Erdmann's Bible lexicon defines it as the highest court of the Jews during Jesus' time, composed of 71 members from the priests, scribes, and the elders of the people, and presided over by the high priest. It is the same body that judges Jesus and that later judges Paul. The hell of fire is a translation of the Greek term, the fires of Gehenna. And Edmund's Bible lexicon again, the valley, a real geographic place, became a place of idol worship and child sacrifice during the period of the monarchy. And so we read in 2 Kings 23, 10, he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the Ben Hinnom, so that no one make a son or daughter pass through fire as an offering to Molech. Topheth is Hebrew and means burning place. It is the actual space where the fire burned in Gehenna, which is in the valley of Ben Hinnom. Passing through fire means that the sacrificed child passes through the fire to the God. In practical terms, that means throwing a living baby into a fire that burns inside a cult statue. And you need drums and loud music to drown out the screams. And the text refers to King Josiah. He is one of four kings, only four kings, who do God's will. All other kings of Israel and Judah are trashed by the Old Testament as fools, sinners, murderers, and cheats who defy the will of God. Josiah defiled Topheth, which means he stopped the slaughter and destroyed the place. Jeremiah is even clearer. In Jeremiah 7.31 we read, and they go on building the high place of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. I have never commanded that. It never crossed my mind, says God through the prophet. And either Jeremiah got the message wrong, or God has reservations about burning people. 2 Chronicles 28, 3. And he made offerings in the valley of the son of Hinnom and made his sons pass through fire according to the abominable practices of the nation whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Burning people is an abomination. Abomination is also a term that is not well understood in our context, but often used to emphasize something that God really doesn't like. That's an abomination. And there are people who focus on the Old Testament co calling homosexual men, not women, men an abomination. Shrimps are also an abomination according to the Old Testament. But that doesn't pe stop people preaching fire and brimstone. You will go to hell and then go and enjoy shrimp cocktails in the church basement. Those preachers gleefully imagine and don't shy away saying that sinners will burn in hell even though God called burning people also an abomination. Or maybe you just need the right reason to imagine holy acts of violence. However, I would say that is foolish 
meaning foolish in the biblical sense, trying to fog up God's vision with burnt offerings, or to these, today's equivalent, getting religion right. It is clear from what happened in Gehenna, where the imagery of hell comes from. It describes a place where God's mercy and goodness, God's love and grace does not exist. It is a place that is ruled by the forces of evil and that treats people with the forces of evil. So, as a Lutheran pastor, I am not responsible for what you believe or for what you do. I am responsible for what you hear from this pulpit. This is a mouth house, as Martin Luther called it. You as Lutherans and guests and everyone else, you are responsible to critically evaluate what you hear here. We, the Lutheran Reformation, which is ongoing and which includes you, we invented public education for exactly that purpose. We do not just want you to or would like you to or ask you to, very friendly and with sugar on top, but we require you to think for yourself. Lutherans do not just believe what is put in front of them. Lutherans ask questions, voice doubts, struggle with how things should be and how they are. We don't leave it at the Bible clearly states, but we actually read what it says. And then we try to figure out what it actually means because everything else would be foolish in the biblical sense. Naturally, we get things wrong and we are not perfect. We are children of our culture and we cannot escape that. But no matter how wrong we are and how imperfect, we are all still able to figure out if someone is driven by grace and love or by forces that don't have their origin in God but come from a far darker place which might already be halfway to Gehenna. We are a Lutheran church community that is committed to peace among each other, peace in the world, to help those in need without measuring the hearts, and to be agents of grace who pour out the love we first receive from God back into the world again. Lutherans are all about grace. Everything else flows from that. And you are intelligent enough to figure out what that means. Amen. <laughs>